other civilizations came along, other advances in economic developments, other ways of exchanging goods that anthropologists talk about in terms of redistribution systems. Now, certain things happen when you have a system of redistribution. Society has to change very, very dramatically. You can make an agreement with somebody in another village to exchange goods as friends, as trade partners, and it doesn't require any great social system. But if you're going to have redistribution, you do have to have a significant advancement in your social structures. The first thing that you have to have in redistribution is the authority to collect goods. Because redistribution means I'm going to take goods or things of wealth for one group and I'm going to redistribute it either to another group or back to the whole. So it is the power to collect goods and then to redistribute it for the common good of all the members of the society. That's what redistribution is all about. Now, um, let, me, let me take you back into the scriptures. You have, you have uh, uh, reciprocity, you have uh, the beginning of some trade, uh, you have, uh, you have uh, people engaging in certain kinds of mercantile uh, procedures. But then comes, then comes that interesting story of uh, Joseph. Joseph as you remember, gets sold to a slave uh, caravan. He gets hauled down to Egypt and he is then sold as a slave into Potiphar's household. And he works there as a servant for Potiphar. Uh, and you know the whole story. Potiphar's wife uh, becomes enamored by him. Uh, she makes a move on him. He rejects it. Uh, then she screams foul and uh, Potiphar throws Joseph into prison. And he's in prison and uh, he becomes uh, well known in prison for being able to read dreams. You know the story, along comes the cook, along comes the butler, um, Pharaoh dreams, hears about Joseph, Joseph comes and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. He says, be seven good years and there will be seven famine years. Now, uh, Pharaoh likes this. Uh, he's impressed. He's heard some good things about Joseph. I suspect that by this point, uh, Potiphar's wife has already uh, been discredited uh, or her integrity has been questioned, but uh, Joseph then gets promoted to being what? Chief tax collector for all of Egypt. Now, I want you to know something. <clears throat> the Bible does not tell us the details, but I have the feeling that Joseph was one of the most despised people in Egypt. <clears throat> he was the tax man. He was assigned a s patrol of Egyptian soldiers and at harvest time it was his job to go around and tax everybody. And so they get this really good year when they really got a good harvest and here comes the tax man and says, I want my cut and people are gonna fork over. And I don't know about you, but when April 15th comes around and I gotta pay my taxes, I am not real super happy about writing a check to the US government. 
Now, maybe you are. I have talked to people who are happy to pay their taxes. I'm not sure I am. But I do it because it's required and I will do it honestly. All right? I'm not going to cheat. I am not going to threaten my integrity, my relationship to God by cheating on my income tax. I will give the government every penny they're due. I will not give them a penny more. If you want to, hey, knock yourself out, whatever floats your boat. Uh, but authority to collect taxes. And of course, if you don't pay, the tax man cometh and you could be in serious trouble. Well, uh, Joseph becomes the chief tax collector and he has the military to back him up. He can come around and he can take by force what you are unwilling to give. So we now have to have not only a tax man, but we have to have tax laws, and then we have to have the authority to enforce that. So around they went collecting extra tax for seven years. And then the famine hits. And Pharaoh is filthy rich. He's got all of these grain houses filled with all of this grain. And now the people can come and get grain from Pharaoh's granaries. Um, boy, I wish we had some more authoritative and historical records on what happened there. I suspect that Pharaoh did not just give it, oh yeah, I got lots, you guys can have all you want. I suspect he sold it back to them. I suspect he got fabulously rich off of it. And everybody was still shaking their fists at Joseph for the fact that first he taxed them, then he's charging them for buying back their food that they had to pay uh, in taxes. But that's another story. Uh, in point of fact, it did save their lives. And sometimes you will do whatever you've got to do to stay alive. And they got through those seven years. And indeed, they were able to sell their grain to people who came even from other countries. And you know the whole story of how his family came to buy grain from the granaries in Egypt. So the authority to collect goods. Uh, then you will use that collection of goods for redistribution for the common good of the people in the society. Now that's what redistribution is all about. Now we have all kinds of examples of redistribution in societies uh, other than Egypt. Uh, the uh, Polynesian Islands was uh, organized around a system of redistribution. And everybody would bring all of their food in and give it to the king. The king would then redistribute it to everybody. So it was, it was I'm not sure I want to call it a, a system of communism, uh, but it was communalism where everybody would, would throw into the common pot and then it would be redistributed to everybody, each according to his means, back to each according to their needs. This was the system of redistribution for common good. Now, it was a simple system, at least in Polynesia. So the farmers would bring their stuff and then it would be redistributed uh, Farmers and fishermen would bring their goods and then it would be redistributed so that those who were part of the king's royal retinue, those who were the canoe makers and builders uh, could have their fair share. And it was a fairly uh, uh, balanced economy in terms of everybody's needs being taken care of. Now, uh, as you get a little bit more complicated, Redistribution for the common good then becomes just a little bit more 
dicey to decide upon. Um, folk are bringing in and producing for the state. This is going to be, this redistribution system is going to be the basic foundation behind communism. Everybody works for the state, everybody produces for the state, the state runs everything, and then the state redistributes to everyone. So, uh, you have guaranteed 100% employment in a system of communism. Everybody has to work, and if you are unemployed, then the government will find you a new job and you will take that new job whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, well, we've got a wonderful opening in Siberia, you know, working in a Stalag or whatever. Um, you also have guaranteed housing even if we have to take housing from the wealthy and give it to you. Uh, er, guaranteed health care. Everything is guaranteed to you because it's all state run. The state works for the common good of everybody and the state collects all of your goods. So this is the whole point behind uh, at least communism or communalism. Well, what are the systems for redistribution. In America, we do not practice a communist system where you work for the state, the state redistributes. We work for uh, a, a private enterprise, but we tax you. So you are taxed, depending on your tax bracket. Let's say the tax bracket that you are in is the 15 to 18% tax bracket. That's normally where middle-class folk are. You are taxed 18%, at least on income tax. You put that into the government coffers. What they do in turn is they will then hire soldiers or pay soldiers, policemen, public health officials, people to build bridges, they will engage in public projects that will serve the well-being of the community. So, um, we gladly pay our taxes. Well, maybe not so gladly, but we pay our taxes, and then we want the government to come back and help to improve our communities. Now, my brother, for a number of years, was the mayor of Redondo Beach, just west of here. When he became mayor, one of the major problems that we had in the city of Redondo Beach was periodic flooding in certain parts of the city. They were the low spots. All the water ran down into these low spots. They would, they would flood. Houses would be damaged. Cars would be stalled out. Uh, and it was a major problem in the city of Redondo Beach. So as, as first of all, as a, uh, a legislator, uh, a councilman in those regions, every time it rained, my brother was around checking where there were flood uh, damage or where there were pockets of water. And one of the things he discovered was we did not have a sufficiently designed sewer system to drain the water out of these areas because the North Redondo area was blocked from the ocean by a huge hill that was just lead down into the ocean. What they needed to do was to tunnel through that hill with a sewer system that would allow the interior valley regions to drain out. So he went to the federal government and he lobbied for and got funding to create this new sewer system so that in the city of North Redondo now, we do not have major flooding. He got tax monies to improve the lives of the people of North Redondo Beach, who in turn could enjoy a better life as a result of taxes. That's what your taxes are supposed to do. Now, 
Uh, we won't go into how that leads to pork barrel uh, projects, et cetera, et cetera. But the whole point of electing our representatives is to go to Washington, represent our needs, and the allocation of tax dollars to come back and improve our lives. <clears throat> A second way that you can redistribute wealth is what we call tribute. Here, you use the, f the threat of force to get people to contribute to the redistribution of wealth. We will protect you. We will watch over you. We will create a safe environment against your enemies, but you got to pay up. So, an army marches in and says, give us some tribute. And if you don't, we'll burn your city down. You pay up, they leave you alone. They may offer you peace, they may just offer to leave you alone. Now, um, we, we actually have uh, um, a, system, a sort of copy of this system uh, here in Southern California, and it's called extortion. And in extortion, uh, you know, a group of gangbangers may go around to a company and a store and say, okay, uh, you, uh, you pay us and we will make sure that, uh, that your company is safe. And if you don't, hey, we're going to bust out your windows tonight. And so, uh, you know, they will extort money uh, from local businesses. Well, um, we even have kids stealing lunch money from other kids. That's a variation, a criminal variation of tribute, but tribute was one way to get people to give uh, to the support of uh, a stronger, uh, more militant organization. You could redistribute labor. Now, um, Indonesia has a very interesting uh, system for redistribution. Um, folk in Indonesia have a very low tax base. As a matter of fact, if, I'm, if I understand, there is no income tax in, in Indonesia. Is that uh, August? Yeah. Is there? There is an income tax. Okay. <laughs> I was never in a region that had enough money for income tax. But uh, a very low base of income tax in Indonesia. Uh, for one of the reasons being people just don't, don't get that many uh, paid uh, salary jobs. Uh, when you get an agricultural community, income tax doesn't work real well. But uh, one of the things that they have is called gotong royong. And in Gotong Arroyo, what you do is every month you donate one day's labor on behalf of the government, or at least on behalf of the common good of the community. So one day a month, everybody in the community will go around and they'll repair potholes in the road. They'll pick up trash, they'll dig out uh, uh, irrigation ditches or sewage ditches. They will, they will give one day of service to improving the community so that the government does not have to pay people to do that. It is labor in exchange for the well-being of everyone. Other ways of doing this is to, is to send a crew of, of uh, say, 30 workers from a village, and they will spend uh, maybe a whole month working on a building project. And I, I believe this may be the way that, at least in Indonesia, they built uh, Borbador. Do you know how they built Borbador, Agus? I think it was volunteer, well, I say volunteer labor. Uh, it, it, was, it was folk coming in and giving uh, 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 weeks or months of labor to help build this huge uh, uh, 
pyramid, if you would, in honor of uh, the Buddhist way of life. And it is not a it's not a, a pyramid like in Egypt where you just buried one man or one family. It was a pyramid that actually uh, was a place of meditation about the five stages of life. And and it and it's marvelously constructed, and they had guys there carving uh, each level as you move your way up until you finally get to the top of the temple, or at least the top of the pyramid. And there you find all of these Buddhas in a uh, in a seated position, meditating. They have finally escaped all of the temptations of life that began down at the bottom level, and they're finally in the total meditative stage. Uh, there, there are thousands of hours of labor in bringing the stones and placing them, carving them, putting them just right, uh, all done through redistribution of labor. So uh, walls around the city, agricultural projects, worship centers, all done by a redistribution of labor when everybody works for the well-being of them all. Well, uh, we move away from redistribution systems to what we call market systems. Now, when you move into a market economy, again, certain things have to happen for a market to exist. And the first of these market conditions, you must have money. Now, money is a fascinating study because what you do is you have a rising power. The rising power decides that they're going to have some kind of a market system that will allow for the exchange of goods. And in order to mark the exchange of goods, they're going to mint some kind of a coin. Inevitably, that coin will have the face of an important individual and then some kind of a marker that indicates that it belongs to a certain empire, civilization, or cultural entity. So you will invent money. Money will then be used with a certain amount of value. Now, the interesting thing that I, that I had never studied money. Uh, frankly, when I went to Bible school, uh, we were not at all interested in economic issues. We didn't believe that had anything to do with the gospel. How wrong I was. But we went to a culture that was a pre-monetary culture. The Donnie folk with whom we became deeply involved in ministry did not have money. Interestingly enough, they did have items of value that were pre-monetary or proto-monetary. They used little cowrie shells from the coast. And these little cowrie shells had made their way all the way from the south coast all the way up through trails and valleys into the highlands and they became symbolic of exchange. You could take one cowrie shell and you could buy a net bag of sweet potatoes. And that cowrie shell, once it came into your possession, could have a little hole drilled on each end of it and it could be sewn onto a little fiber belt, if you would, and you could get a fiber belt maybe six feet long with literally dozens of these shells, cowrie shells, sewn onto it. And if you had such a cowrie shell belt, you could then come to a major negotiation and you would say, I want to buy a pig. And here's a cowrie shell belt to pay for it. That's sort of like having a, you know, $100 bill. 
or more. So, uh, and you could use it, you could use it in uh, uh, bride wealth exchanges. You could use it for anything expensive. And so you would see these entire shell band uh, uh, belts that became then a matter of uh, wealth. Now, when we went in, when we went in, we discovered that they wanted these shells. Well, we know where to get the shells. See? They're down on the coast. So, so we pay people to go pick them off of the beach. See, And, uh, you know, we'll give you $2 if you bring us a bucket of cowrie shells. So they'd bring us a bucket of cowrie shells, and then we'd fly them into the interior, and then we could use those cowrie shells to buy sweet potatoes or to pay people to work on the airstrip. Well, you know what we did? We immediately ruined the value. That's sort of like printing money. You know? We caused a horrible inflationary cycle. And finally they said, ah, we don't want any more cowrie shells. You know, quit giving us those cheap things. Oh boy, what have we done now? So we had to come up with a different way of, uh, of uh, and we, by the way, we've been criticized by anthropologists for doing that. Uh, uh, lousy missionaries went in and changed the culture, ruined it, or blah, blah, blah. Uh, so we had to introduce something else. So I showed up and cowrie shells had lost their value. And so we used to, we used to, uh, started paying them then after that with a, a little cup of sugar or salt because they were very, very hungry for salt. So we would, you know, a day's work is worth a little, uh, a little cup of salt. So we'd, uh, at the end of each day's labor, they'd come and they'd bring a, a, a banana leaf and we'd give them a cup of salt and they'd take that home. Uh, after a while, they'd say, ah, we got enough salt. What are we going to do now? So we started uh, giving them little, uh, little slips of paper that I would say this little slip of paper with Hayward's signature on it is worth one day's worth of labor. And then every Monday, <clears throat> we would open up a little uh, uh, window on a shed that we had there, and people would come and say, okay, I've got five little markers for uh, five days of work, and I'd like to buy something. And I said, okay, I've got soap, I've got salt, I've got little knives, I've got axes, I've got pants, I've got shirts, you know, what do you want? And, uh, and they would come and, oh, I, I want to buy an axe. Well, it's 30 days worth of work. Ah, oh, I've only got 20 days. Hey, can anybody else help me? And, you know, a bunch of other guys would throw up a couple of markers and he finally plunked down 30 markers. Boom, I'd give him an axe. Oh. Isn't this wonderful? I got an ax or whatever. Well, um, we, int <laughs> we introduced markers and that lasted for maybe uh, five or six or seven years. And finally we said, okay, by now they are sufficiently familiar with the fact that a marker has a certain amount of value. Let's start using real money. And so we started using then Indonesian rupees, and we would pay people in rupees. We actually introduced real monetary exchange. They were quickly moving into a market economy. They could figure out a bag of cabbage was worth so many rupees. A handful of carrots was worth so many rupees. A day's labor was worth so many rupees. We saw the Donnie in the course of one lifetime go from pre-monetary exchange system of, of reciprocity all the way up to a market condition with money. Now, this is all familiar ground to most of us, but it's very important social development because what it requires is some kind of a price setting system. We have to establish the value of certain items of food, certain items of labor. Can you sell your labor and how much is a day's labor worth? 
Can you establish a price on a certain amount of food or a certain uh, commodity that might be produced? So you have a price setting system. Thirdly, in order for a market to exist, you cannot have coercion in exchanges. If you are forced to sell your goods at a certain price, the market will collapse. If you do not have freedom to let prices rise and fall according to market conditions, if, it, if, if a soldier can walk up to a woman in the marketplace and say, I want to buy a dozen potatoes, pulls his rifle around and points it at her and says, you will sell me a dozen potatoes for a nickel. And she has no option but to get shot or give you her potatoes for a nickel. That's not a market condition. You have to have lack of coercion. This has been some of the problems with controlled economies. Well, market conditions lead to market principles. All right. I hope this isn't too boring because it's going to, I hope it's going to get a little bit more exciting as we get through some of this basic stuff. You have to be able to assign monetary value to goods and services. And you have to have people who are willing to engage in the market. Now, one of the interesting things that, that happened in, uh, again, see, I got to see all of this living in a pre monetary culture. One of the things that happened was we who were strangers living in the highlands needed food. We did not have gardens. We could not grow our own food. So one of the things that we told people was every Monday we will buy food for the entire week. So if you will bring food on Monday, we'll buy it. That'll be market day. And so they would come and they would sit in this huge long circle at the top of the airstrip. And we would come out there with our little markers or with our rupees, and we would buy the food that we needed. We would buy sweet potatoes, we would buy white potatoes, we would buy cabbage, carrots, whatever we needed. And, uh, and the people would come on Monday. Uh, Monday was also the day when we opened up our little, uh, our little warehouse and redeemed uh, either the money that, they, that we had given them or the work stubs that we'd given them. So Monday, interestingly enough, because they did not have a seven day a week schedule like we have. They just, you know, lived every day however it came. But they quickly identified, oh, Monday is the day we have market day. So the Donnie named Monday market day. Tuesday became the first day of school because we used to have uh, a, a Bible school that, that operated three days a week. So they, uh, Tuesday became the first day of school. Wednesday became the second day of school. And... Thursday became the third day of school. And Friday, Friday was the day we told them all to go back home and teach everybody what they'd been learning in school. So we had literacy classes Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We had Bible classes for some of the, uh, the early witness men and they would learn Bible stories Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then Friday, they'd go back and teach it in their villages. So Friday was the day we tell our stories back home. And then Saturday, well, Saturday became the day when they had to gather double food because Sunday was the day of worship and they were not supposed to work in their gardens on Sunday. So every day was named after a function. Now, uh, we didn't plan that this way. I mean, they, th this was the way that it began to emerge from their culture. But what was interesting was as that began to emerge, when Indonesians came in to live in the highlands, Monday became market day. Then they discovered that 
they could also make Tuesday a market day. Then they decided they needed a marketplace. So one of the things the Indonesian government did was set up a marketplace see, where people could come, put their goods out there and sell their vegetables or whatever it is that they had to sell in a marketplace. A market economy was beginning to emerge that was in keeping with entire market principles. So the marketplace is set up. Today, we call them shopping malls. But they are, in essence, the marketplace of modern market systems. You can have strip malls, you can have uh, 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 mega malls, you can have whatever we want to set up that becomes a major place for the exchange of goods. And if you really want to see a marketplace in existence, you go to Minneapolis and you go to the Mall of America. <laughs> huge towering marketplace uh, where you can play games, you can shop in dozens of stores and you can eat to your heart's content. Uh, people fly in just to go shopping at the Mall of America. It has got to be the temple of materialism for all of America. Well, uh, you also have to have a self-regulating economy and, uh, and, uh, and I'm not going to get into this. You'll get into this if you take uh, classes on business and economics. But uh, uh, you have to have an economy that is driven by market demands. And so the hidden hand of the market uh, is uh, operational there. And it will determine whether uh, goods are desirable, whether people will produce them, um, how much people want to produce them, and how they will make them available. An uh, interesting guy in all of this is a fellow by the name of Jeffrey Sachs, S-A-C-H-S. Jeffrey Sachs is an outstanding economist. And one of the things that Jeffrey Sachs did was help some of the uh, former communist countries moved to market economies. And, uh, and they spent hours uh, working with uh, uh, government leaders and economists in Eastern Europe to transform from communism to uh, market uh, economies. And one of the things they said was, look at the price of eggs. The price of eggs will become the marker for whether we have succeeded or not. So they dropped price controls, which was part of the old communist system. They went to a free market system. Price controls dropped and everybody waited anxiously to find out what would happen. And the first couple of days, it was tense. Nothing was there. People were waiting to see what would take place. Then all of a sudden, people started to show up on the streets selling stuff. And sure enough, all of a sudden, where before there was a scarcity of goods, all of a sudden, here were huge tables filled with eggs. Eggs became available again. And it became the marker for the fact that Eastern Europeans were beginning to transition to the free market principles and scarcity was wiped out almost overnight by the return to free market principles. This is all recorded, by the way, in a marvelous series of uh, videos called uh, The uh, Commanding Heights. You can get it in the library. You can look at it. If you're interested in, in rural economics, The Commanding Heights is a good study of moving from uh, government-controlled markets to a free market system. Well, uh, one of the interesting aspects of all of this is uh, the fact that in a market economy, one of the major 
systems in market economies is what we call capitalism. And we're going to spend almost all the rest of our time uh, in today's lecture on this subject of capitalism. It's an appropriate time to talk about capitalism because we have literally thousands of people right now who are um, demonstrating in Wall Street and they are protesting capitalism. They're here in Los Angeles. They're global at this point. A number of things are happening here. We're going to talk a little bit about their protest against capitalism. But let's look at the concepts of capitalism. First of all, in order to have a system of capitalism, you have to have the right to ownership of land. You have to have ownership of land. Now, you did not have ownership of land in Russia under communism. Nobody owned their own farm. Nobody owned their own factory. Nobody owned their own home. The government owned it all, and they allocated it bureaucratically. Ownership of land is one of the major requirements for a capitalist system. Now, there is at least one economist, a Latin American economist, who says, this is his argument, he calls it the mystery of capitalism. His name is De Soto. De Soto says the reason developing countries are not progressing well economically is because ownership of land has never been guaranteed. People are farming on land that they do not have legal title to. And therefore, they cannot give their land to their children, so they cannot improve the land and be guaranteed that they have a right to maintain that land. So he says ownership of land is the whole key to a capitalist system. You may want to chew on that one a while. It is one of the reasons why Russia has struggled so hard to get into a market, free market economy because they never had ownership of land and didn't know how to return it to the people, at least effectively. Secondly, you have to have control of the means of production. In other words, people have to have the right to produce for the marketplace. People have to have the right to buy a sewing machine, to call that sewing machine their own, and then the right to buy cloth and to make a piece of clothing and then to sell it in the marketplace. And if they are clever, they will buy two or three or four sewing machines and they will get some people to come and make clothes. They may just have them in the living room, whatever. They have the control over the means of production and they cannot be stopped. Oh, you don't have the right to it. Now, this raises all kinds of interesting problems. If you're going to be looking at the development of the Western world, there was in the uh, uh, earlier days a system of what we call guilds, production guilds. So you had to be a member of a guild if you were going to make anything. So you had to be a member of the Haberdashers Guild. What's a Haberdasher? Anybody know what a Haberdasher is? Men's fine clothing. Haberdashers were, they were, you know, they made, uh, they made hats and gloves and things like that for, for gentlemen. Now, uh, I've heard, I don't know this for certain, I've been unable to trace it back, but I've heard that I had a great, great, great grandfather who was a member of the Haberdashers uh, Guild in, uh, in London. 
Okay. And, and so he would have been trained as a young boy in how to make hats and gloves and fine clothes for gentlemen. Okay. And he would have been a member of the Haberdashers Guild. Nobody else could make these things. You had to be in the guild. And they maintained control over their production. These Haberdasher Guilds, all of these guilds controlled production now that was all right, except that it restricted the growth of the market economy. And it had to be, there, Europe had to go through a system of breaking the power of the guilds and their control over the marketplaces for Europe to break through into the Industrial Revolution and to break into a, a major expansion of wealth. Now, once again, there are marvelous books on this subject. Uh, the Wealth and Poverty of Nations is one such book. It talks about how guilds in France actually did everything they could to stop independent uh, uh, minded women from making clothes and they would go around and break up their uh, their equipment and uh, and actually drove them out of the city well um, capitalism to succeed has to allow people control over the means of production then there is what exploitation of labor now, you're not going to read that in your uh, business classes because we don't like to talk about exploiting the working class. That's the kind of thing you hear in communist uh, oriented classes, you know, you know, rise up, you've got nothing to lose but your chains and the exploitation of labor and the conflict between uh, uh, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. But in point of fact, Capitalism uh, is, um, is built on the backs of a strong labor force. And finding inexpensive labor is one of the chief functions of capitalism. We have always tried to build the economic strength, the productive strength of the nation on the backs of cheap labor. Now, there are a number of ways that we have done that. We started America. We started America uh, by sending a bunch of folk over here who would provide um, uh, good free labor. But, um, after a while, we discovered that we could not count on the Native Americans to be a cheap source of labor. They didn't want to work for cheap. And they took off and they went living uh, in the forest. So we had to find another form of cheap labor. How did we find cheap labor to help develop the economy of North America? Well, we went to the prisons in England and they had what they called debtor's prisons in those days. Debtor's prisons were if you got into debt, took out too much money on your credit card and couldn't pay it off, then you got arrested and thrown in jail. Now, how are you gonna pay off your credit card in jail? Well, either a family member is gonna come along and pay your credit card bill for you, or somebody else will come and buy your debt or pay for it and then they own you. You now must work for that person that paid off your debt. And one of the things they did was they would fill ships going to America with what were called indentured servants. Indentured servants were people who had a debt they couldn't pay. It was paid off by a businessman. That indentured servant was then sent to America Somebody in America would buy your debt then from the, your owner and you would then be, have to work for them for five years, 10 years, whatever, as an indentured servant. Once the debt had been paid off, you were free then to become a free man. 
another system was growing up simultaneously with the indentured servants, and that was slavery. That ship pulled into New Amsterdam, load of slaves on board, they were snapped up immediately. As a matter of fact, one of my ancestors was one such person. Bought up in the slave markets in New Amsterdam, went with her new owner up into uh, uh, the interior of uh, New York State and, uh, and worked there until uh, her daughter was finally able to get her freedom, bought for by a French uh, fur trader who came down from Quebec, bought her, married her, took her back to Quebec, legally married her, and bore uh, 14 kids for him, and here I am. Uh, free, inexpensive labor. Well, after a while, uh, we started running out of uh, slaves. Uh, we started running out of uh, indentured servants. So we had to get some folk over here who would work real cheap. One of the ways was to bring in Irish laborers. They were starving to death. They were desperate to get out of Ireland. Bring over boatloads of Irish who are willing to work just for the food. Uh, we brought over uh, immigrants from Italy and other parts of poverty-stricken Europe. And we even put a statue up and said, give us your poor, give us your downtrodden. Why? cheap labor, see? And so we got all this cheap labor in here, and eventually we ran out of cheap labor from Europe. So what did we do next? We went south to Mexico, bringing in cheap labor from Mexico. During World War II, and shortly thereafter, for a number of years, we had what was known as a guest laborer program, see? the Bracero program. And Mexican labor could come up and work in American agriculture, F cheap. That started creating some tensions which we continue to live with today. And then we discovered a whole new way to get cheap labor. Send our work request overseas. So, we started sending manufacturing over to Singapore, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Pakistan, Indonesia. We started to foster labor overseas that would be capable of producing the goods that we want inexpensively. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are wearing, doesn't look like too many, uh, Nike tennis shoes. Okay, Nike tennis shoes used to be made in a big factory in Indonesia. And uh, uh, they would work all day long making tennis shoes, put them on in cargoes, ship them here to the United States, and you would buy them in uh, department stores. Indonesian workers decided to go on strike to ask for a raise. So they struck the Nike plant, and they said, we want a pay raise. Now we got a crisis, because you know what? Those Indonesian workers were getting the exorbitant salary of $1 a day. $1 a day for making shoes to put on your feet. And they went on strike and said, we want a dollar and a quarter a day. Oh, you wretched people. Greedy, 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 greedy. And you know what Nike said? Can do it. Mm -mm, marketplace won't bear it. You want a dollar and a quarter? We're out of here. 
And you know what Nike did? They moved out of Indonesia and they went to Bangladesh, where Bangladesh women would be willing to work for a dollar a day. You get to wear cheap Nike. Well, no, they're not that cheap. Who's getting all that money? Not the women in Indonesia and not the women in Bangladesh. We keep looking for cheap markets, cheap laborers. And we found them overseas. Now, something very interesting is happening because globalization has now opened up the whole world and all of these manufacturing jobs have gone overseas. And now all of a sudden, we're discovering that there are no cheap jobs, or at least no jobs that will pay us at the salaries that we want left in America. Now, my daughter discovered this when she graduated from high school and decided she wanted to get a job. She didn't want to go to college. So she started looking at the job market. You know what she found out? Every job that she wanted could be done by a Mexican laborer who would work longer and harder and cheaper than she could work. There was no market for somebody with a high school education out there. Cheap labor was in abundance. So my daughter ended up having to go back to college and she learned some skills. She currently works at a hospital as a skilled surgical technician. She's making fairly decent salary. Why are you here? Because without advanced education, you are going to be competing in the same marketplace with women from Bangladesh. And that's the realities of globalization today. Well, I'm not sure where exploitation of labor is going to go, but it is a part of capitalism. And here comes point number four. In capitalism, you have the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. This, this fourth point, is the one that's got everybody upset. This is why countries around the globe do not like capitalism. This is one of the reasons why they don't like America. This is one of the reasons why you got protesters in Wall Street right now. The wealthy are getting wealthier and the poor are getting poorer. There is a huge gap and President Obama has stuck his foot into it by promoting class warfare. He's talking about taxing the rich in order to help the poor. And he has created a class warfare mentality that is going to be very difficult to put back into the box. I'm not going to comment on politics. But economically, we've got a problem. Now, what do I mean about this concentration of wealth in the hands of a few? Let's look at a few statistics. If you look at the super rich, the super rich constitute one half of 1% of the population of America. They are so super rich. I mean, these are the millionaires and billionaires. They control 35.1% of the wealth in the American economy. Then you have another group. They're called the very rich. These are people who make millions of dollars. They are, again, one half of 1% but they only control 6.7%. And then you have the rich. These are people who make, um, I think the figure may be a quarter of a million dollars a year or more. They constitute 9% uh, uh, of the population. And they control 29% of the 
wealth. So these top 10% of the United States control 71.7% .7 of the wealth of America. And the other 90% of the population has access to only 28.3% of the wealth. Now that's capitalism. And as a matter of fact, on, August, on October 10th, Time Magazine did a new study and showed that 20% of households in America now own 85% of the wealth in all of America. The other 80% are stuck with the crumbs. All right, that's capitalism. That's what happens in capitalism. The wealthy have the resources to make money, to get money, to keep money, to enjoy money, and to control all of the things that come with having money. And the rest are just struggling to get by. Now, right now we're talking about the shrinking middle class. I don't know if you've been listening to the news. The shrinking middle class. What is causing the shrinking middle class? According to Jeffrey Sachs, I've talked about him before, he's, he's written a new book called uh, The Price of Civilization. I just ordered it up, I'm gonna read it because uh, I'm kind of interested in these things. But he says the net increase in wealth in the middle class peaked in the late 1970s. So for the last 20 or 30 years, the middle class is not significantly jumping up into a higher percentage. Furthermore, with unemployment now reaching millions of people, you are shrinking from the bottom, you're getting no growth at the top, middle class is now feeling the squeeze and this is becoming a social and economic crisis. Well, let's look at 2004 income tax returns. 9,677 people earned more than $10 million in one year. 15,835 people earned between five and $10 million. 65,548 earned between two and five million, and 582,000 earned between 500,000 and two million. Okay, now those are uh, six years old, but uh, they're fairly representative of the kinds of things that are happening. These are the people who are considered the super rich. See? These are the one half of 1%. Now, if you look at this, 420,000 super rich families control $10.6 trillion of the wealth of America. Who are these super rich families? Well, there are the Waltons. Who are the Waltons? Anybody know the Walton family? They're the owners of Walmart. The owners of Walmart, there are five of them, I believe four, four brothers and a sister, uh, but anyway, five of them, and they own money coming out everywhere. Then there's the Kennedy family, you know. Kennedys of New York, uh, every year they get together and divide up their share of the wealth for this year. And every one of them are given, you know, X number of millions of dollars as their allotment. Well, uh, there are these wealthy families. Uh, 420,000 very rich families, they hold 1.7 million after they sell everything else off. And the rich families are those with a net worth of at least a half a million dollars. So there are a very few wealthy, influential people who own the wealth of America. Well, let's look at 
this little list. Here are the highest paid entertainers for the year 2011. That's from 10,010 until now. Oprah Winfrey in the last 12 months earned $290 million. Good on you, Oprah. Then comes U2. U2, $195 million. Tyler Perry. Who is Tyler Perry? Huh? Who is he? Medea, you know? Okay, you know? Angry black woman and all that sort of stuff. That's Tyler Perry. $130 million. Bon Jovi. 125, Jerry Bruckheimer. I don't even know who Jerry Bruckheimer is. 113 million. Uh, Steven Spielberg makes great movies. 107 million. Elton John, 100 million. Lady Gaga, oh, stop my beating heart. 90 million dollars, one year. Simon Cowell, 90 million. James Patterson, 80. Dr. Phil McGraw? <laughs> Dr. Phil made $80 million? The guy's a quack. <laughs> I'm going to get sued for that one. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. DiCaprio, who got that extra O in there? $77 million for taking a, a cruise on the Titanic. <laughs> Tagger Wood, 75 million. Jerry Seinfeld, 70 million. Dick Wolf, 70 million. James Cameron, 70 million. Howard Stern? Potty Mouth Howard Stern, 67 million. Paul McCartney, 67. Rush Limbaugh? Oh my goodness, I could spout all kinds of stupid stuff, and if I could make 64 million, Ryan Seacrest, 61 million, Black Eyed Peas, 60, Donald Trump, 60 million, Bethany Frankel, I bet you don't know who Bethany Frankel is. Who knows who Bethany Frankel is? Oh, a couple of you do, okay. And then, my favorite of all, <laughs> Justin Bieber. Fifty-five million dollars. The boy's not even thirty. Justin Bieber, fifty-five. Now here's capitalism at its best in one year. What's Justin Bieber got that I don't have? Why are you laughing? What's so funny about that? Well, I know, I can't carry a bucket in a tune, so. Well, anyway, no, it's a tune in a bucket. Well, whatever it is. Okay, let me ask you this, though. By comparison, the average Los Angeles County school teacher earns $50,000 per year. It would take over 1,000 years to make the bottom of this list. So I want to ask you, is Justin Bieber really worth more than 1,000 teachers in L.A. County? Hmm? The combined wealth of these 24 people would pay the salaries of 45,000 people for one year. Do you realize that? If they would just give back their wealth, we could hire 45,000 people right away at $50,000 a year. Now, wouldn't that be a good thing to do? Hmm? Come on, Justin. $55 million, you aren't even old enough to handle that amount of money. We're gonna give you five million. Cut it out. Live on five million. Tough it out, dude. <laughs> We're going to take 50 million and we're going to hire a thousand school teachers for LA. Isn't that, wouldn't that be a better economic system? Would it? Would it be a better system? Or would it kill capitalism? And if it killed capitalism, what would be its replacement? Now, this is the dilemma we are in right now. What to do with this disparity of wealth? Since the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor, what should the government do? Tax the rich? 
You see, now that's one of the proposals. Tax the rich. And take that money. Take Justin Bieber's $50 million and create more social services for the poor. Do you want to go with that? Join the protests in Wall Street and vote for that particular government policy. Or do you want to require that the rich reinvest all of this money into jobs? Now, Warren Buffett just invested $5 billion into Bank of America. He probably saved Bank of America's life, to tell you the truth. He invested $5 billion into Bank of America in order to keep Bank of America afloat, in order to allow Bank of America to continue to hire people and invest money into businesses. Was that a good decision, or should, should he have just given his money to the poor? Now, just for, by way of comparison, if he had given his $5 billion away to every poor family, every poor family would have gotten $500. So did he do the right thing by investing in business? Should he have given it to the poor? Should he be required to invest in jobs? Or should we just leave them alone? Do we just let the hidden hand of the marketplace guide us? Or should we try to regulate business and wealth? These are the options that are before us. And do you want to know something? Every one of these are on the table. Another chart, real quick. Over here, You've got your 10, 1, 10, 20, 5. Uh, look at how much taxes they pay. The top 20% pay 69% of the United States taxes. The middle 60% pay 30%. The bottom 20% pay only 1%. We are already taxing the top 20% of our country for 70%, and yet we continue to get these Tax them more, tax them more, tax them more. Is that the right answer? So what do we conclude as Christians? Who should bear the responsibility for helping the poor? Is it the job of government? Is it the job of business? Private agencies or the church? This is the dilemma that we're now facing. Wall Street demonstrators right now are trying to protest what the government does for the poor. And secondly, how can or how should Christian virtues and or government regulations put these restraints upon human greed? And there's no question but that capitalism is one of the greatest ways of increasing productivity. It is also susceptible to producing human greed. What is going to be our Christian response? This is the challenge of modern day economics. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.